This morning, we're going to be looking at the book of John, um, John chapter 17. And um, when I began really preparing for this morning's ser uh, sermon, and the title is Not of This World, um, she has known several things that's been happening in our country. And, um, you know, it's easy to to really get up, caught up in your emotions and respond right away. And this is how I feel. And to be honest with you, I saw a lot of people respond on Facebook. This is how I feel, what's happening. And I think looking at it in perspective, it's so always important for us to always think about, about what we, you know, don't just let your emotion lead you and always think first and really as Christians, looking at the Word of God for wisdom. Because I think it's easy as humans to, to use our emotions, to use our convictions, to just say, you know, this is, this is why I'm not happy, this is not right. But I think if we look at God's Word and allow the wisdom of God to teach us and to direct us, it could really help us a lot. And throughout history, many changes has occurred. I, I, my wife and I are watching this, this show called Mr. Selfridge. We're big British shows fans. And, you know, we go on Netflix. And, and it's during World War II. And I still, they, they, they depicted, they depicted a, a time where women, women are beginning to really stand up and ask for the right to vote. And, and just watching that show and looking at it and how the culture was so against it, not wanting women to have equal rights rights, that they were below men. And even that time, the culture was frustrated and there was a difficulty. And some wanted women's rights, right? And some wanted women to stay at home and not have those rights. You see, many changes has occurred in our history before. And it's not the first time that culture shifts occurred. Um, as you guys all know, there's a big shift that the Supreme Court ruled a couple weeks ago, um, last week, with same-sex marriages. And I think it's important as a church that we hear from God's Word and how we respond, how we react to it. That we don't let our emotions really lead us and dictate how we should respond to it. But we need to look at God's Word for wisdom and perspective. You see, our culture has been changing. It's been changing since the beginning. And with these new changes, we have been taught, I believe, to, to believe that to love someone, Vivian, means we agree with everything they believe or do. Like, for you, for you to love someone, you have to agree with everything they believe or do. That also that... Our culture is teaching is that, even in the Christian culture, that we must isolate ourselves from the world because it's changing so rapidly and, and at times it's uncomfortable, at times it, it makes us really cringe so that we may not be influenced. Uh, maybe you've heard of different uh, religious groups who decided to just buy their own land and isolate themselves from the modern world so that their children and their children will not be influenced, right? And lastly, just this influence of we have to compromise as Christians. His word, in order to be compassionate. That I cannot be compassionate to someone who, uh, who may not have the same values or faith that I have unless I compromise the word of God. You see, those things that's being taught by culture, Christian or not Christian, is happening today. As the church, how do we respond? As followers of Christ, how do we respond? You see, we are all affected by these new changes in our culture. Whether you like it or not, it affects us all. And maybe you are already facing it or will face it someday. And as a husband, a father, how do I lead my family, how do I lead my son, Ethan, William, and Jackson, my sons, in the midst of these cultural changes that's happening? in our country and in our world. As single adults, how do you approach the changes that's still, again, 
happening and, and how do you approach it and still follow Christ? As teenagers, where do you look for directions? Where do you look for truth? What is truth? Does culture dictate truth? You see, these are all important questions we need to ask ourselves, Christian or not Christian. This morning, there's great news. It's, under, it's important to understand that cultural changes has been happening for a long time. And that we must look to God's word and how to respond to it, how to adapt to it. If you look at the book of John, chapter 17, it talks about Jesus, and they call this the highly uh, priest prayer, where Jesus begins to pray for his disciples. And the book of John is one of the four Gospels. We know them as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the book of John really tells the story of Jesus as the promised Messiah. And if you ever read the book of John, it highlights Jesus as the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. And here in chapter 17, it really shows Jesus praying to the Father and beginning in 9, 18, praying for his disciples. You see, it's, um, as you read this, Jesus shows an example of him becoming our advocator, him as our advocate in praying to the Father for us. And I really love the fact that in this passage, Jesus prays for us. That as he begins to let his disciples know that he is going to be crucified and that he's going back to the Father, he begins to pray for us. So let's read chapter 17 of John, beginning at 9. It says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Here Jesus began to emphasize to his disciples that he's praying for them. And that, and that wonderful truth is so amazing because think about it. Jesus prays for us. He prays for us. I mean, that alone should be um, just so gratifying as a follower of Christ to, to know that the God who created the heavens and the earth prays for us every day. And that it's important to the disciples to understand this because, again, he wanted to let them know that he is no longer going to be in the world, but they will be in the world. Now, in verse 7 and 9, it's saying that I'm not praying for the world, but for those who you have given me. It's not that Jesus is not, doesn't care for the world. But in this specific moment, he's just specifically praying for the disciples. And he really wants to, to the disciples to understand that as they begin to go into the world to share about Jesus, to go and make disciples, that they're going to need his prayer. That there are going to be cultural changes. There, there's going to be times that they'll be persecuted for their faith. That there's going to be a time that they're not even going to be a majority. And at that moment, they weren't even a majority. They were just a tiny, small sect in the culture. A new faith that's coming in, a new religion that people say, new religion. And some people even call them a cult. But there Jesus, again, points out that he's no longer in the world, but his disciples will be in the world. It's important for us to understand that, that God wants us to be in the world. Not so much that we can be like the world, no. So that we could be lights of the world. We could be, he talks about in, in Matthew that we are salt of the earth. 
If you ever had, if you like food and you're a foodie, you know that salt and pepper, right, taste is important. I mean, you ever had a bland, um, I don't know, um, brisket? Nasty, right? Or, or um, I, for me, if, when I eat my my mashed potato, I, I tend to put um, not rice. Sorry, I tend to put salt and pepper, right? And here, Jesus really wanted to know that he will no longer be in the world, but they have to be in the world, and also that. Not only that, as they face difficult challenges ahead, what does it say here? In verse 12, oh, I'm sorry, verse, verse 11, it says, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name. Keep them in your name. Which really shows that Jesus wanted his disciples to keep looking to God and for God to, to so for them not to forsake what God, what Jesus has been teaching them. And then it says there, which you have given me that they may be one as we are one. I really like the fact that Jesus said that he prayed for us to be one. Because it's so easy to be divided, am I right? It's so easy to feel like, you know, things are just going out of whack. Things are changing in our culture. We're, we, we're not a majority anymore. Things are just so upside down. It's so easy to be divided, even within the Christian groups. But here Jesus prays for us and prays for the Father to keep us united. And looking as the example, the, the true example of unity is the Father and the Son. That they were one. See, God wants us to be together. God wants us to stay together in the midst of cultural changes, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of storms in our lives. Three things sticks out, I believe, in 9 through 13. As Jesus prays for us, he prays that we look to him. He prays that we remember as we look to him that he is our advocate, that he advocates for us. He's our lawyer, if you think about it. As, as we come to, as we serve God, as we ask for forgiveness, Jesus advocates for us through the Father. Because it's only through Christ that we are forgiven, amen? It is through His blood that we have been forgiven. And not only does we, we have to look to Jesus, He prays that we stay together. We stay together as a family, as God's people. And lastly, and in verse um, 12, it says this. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them have been lost except the son of destruction, Judas. That's what he's talking about, Judas. That the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may, they may have my joy filled, fulfilled in themselves. What is that joy that Jesus is talking about that we may be filled in ourselves? He's talking about himself. That Christ is praying that the disciples, as they face the world, as they face persecution, as they face trials and changes, he prays that, that we find joy not in ourselves, not in our accomplishments, not even in the church itself, but we find our joy in Christ. That we are able to face the world and its changes because we have the joy of the Lord in us. Jesus fulfills that. Because if you think about it, if we put our faith and hope in our security, in our jobs, in our education, in our family heritage, It would fail. We, we, would, we would fall short. Because those things cannot give us fulfillment and full joy in our lives. 
because those things come and go. Even family, my family can betray me and can let me down. But if I put my faith and true joy in Christ, then no matter what happens in my life, Vivian, no matter what happens in our country, I will be secured because I have put my hope and faith in Christ. And He is the one that gives me joy. There's this movie called Fury. Maybe it's a little older. Maybe this is not, I think it's rated R. And, and it's based in 1945. And I, I was a history major and I love World War II, World War I history. I, I love it. And so much that I did my senior thesis on U-boats and how it affected World War II. And anyways, that's a little boring. But basically, this movie called Fury, and I would suggest it for the adults. It's a really good movie. And it talks about um, this, this guy named War Daddy. Yeah, that was his name, War Daddy. And, and there, he, War Daddy is played by Brad Pitt. So if you're a Brad Pitt fan, you'll probably want to watch it. And, and there, he, he leads... He's, a, he's, he's the leader of a, a Sherman tank, okay? The Sherman tank, that's the American tank. And there, he commands a Sherman tank of five people. And, and they're basically, the war's almost over, and their job is to go into enemy territory and just weed out all the SS soldiers. The highly elite Nazi soldiers. And, and, and the war pretty much is over. But in this movie... War Daddy and the rest of the, his, his men go into enemy territory. And if you think about it, the, the last SS soldiers are really the ones that's holding on and really fighting for the last hope for the German nation. And there as he fights them, and there was a scene where they really had to hold down a road where um, the final stage of the SS army is coming and the rest of the battalion from the, the, the allies are coming and they needed to set it up and defend that bridge. It was like, it's not a bridge, it's a, it, was a, it was a road. And they had a choice to either say, you know what, this is crazy, there's only one of us and there's a thousand SS soldiers coming, let's just go back because we won the war. And, and a few of the men wanted to say, you know what, War Daddy, we're done. Let's just go. It's not worth it. Our lives is not worth it. We fought for so long and the war is over. But War Daddy wanted to really continue and fulfill his duty. And so they looked to him for direction. And they stayed united. No matter the obstacles, they stayed united. And in the end, sorry, spoiler alert, it didn't go so well. It didn't go so well. But you see, what I admired about War Daddy and the rest of his men was that they really fulfilled their mission. They didn't give up. They stood their ground, no matter the difficulties, and they stayed united as brothers. Now that we've learned that as we face cultural changes, that we're not of this world. But just because we're not of this world, God wants us to be in the world. And as we face cultural changes, we need to look to Jesus. We need to stay together. And we need to find joy in Christ. In verse 14, 15 and 16, it says, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I think in this passage, in 14 to 16, Jesus really wants to highlight that we're not of this world. That as followers of Christ, we are part of God's kingdom now. And here, Jesus has given us what? In verse 14, His Word. 
it's important to understand that as we face changes, and maybe even it doesn't have to be what's happening today, it could be in your family, it could be something personal, that Jesus has given us His Word. And that we need to look to God's Word for wisdom and direction. But as, God, as Jesus gives us the Word, He reminds us. And I think this is so important for us Christians to understand and know that we are not of this world. And He says that twice, right? He says that twice. He says in 14... It says there, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, 15, but keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And what is the world, what will the world do to us? And Jesus prayed it. The world will what? Because we're not of this world, the world will what? Would hate us. It would hate us. And here, Jesus was really trying to pray for his disciples because as they faced the world, the Roman Empire at that time, they were the minority. They were seen as a cult. They were seen by Judaism as, as a, a new religion that's trying to, again, divide Judaism, right? Because they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. They were still waiting for the Messiah. And here, Jesus wanted to let them know that they will be hated. And not only hated, but Jesus wanted to pray that they would be protected from the evil one. And when I, when, I, when I think about Jesus praying from the evil one, I look at my own life. How Satan every day tries his very best to tempt me, tries his very best to discourage me, tries his very best to, to divide my marriage. And that's just only in my home front. But then he tries other things in terms of ministry, in terms of friends, in terms of, of desires, in terms of hopes, dreams, materialism. I mean, if you ever think about the number of times that we are tempted every day to disobey God, to walk away from God, I mean, it would just be staggering. Because Satan loves to deceit, loves to lie to us, loves to really tell us lies about who Jesus is. And here I love the fact that Jesus prayed to the Father to protect us. As we face cultural changes, I will let you know now, it's not going to get any easier. Because the world will be the world. And I think that's an important perspective to have as followers of Christ. We can't expect the world to be like Christ because it's not. Even when Jesus was on, here on earth, it was acting like the world. And the world will be the world, but we as followers of Christ needs to really, we really need to have that in perspective that we are not of this world. That we need to continue to be obedient to His Word. And that He's given us His Word as our direction, as, as, as our compass. There's a, if you guys ever uh, read. The Ugly Duckling story. You guys probably probably heard it, right? Chris Anderson's um, story about the Ugly Duckling. And when I, when I thought about this illustration, I really liked it. It made me laugh because I won't give it away. I'm going to talk about it right now. And if you remember the Ugly Duckling, um, who, whose appearance was ugly, right? And, and really, his appearance or her appearance, or, was it a girl or boy? We don't know. We don't know. But anyways, his appearance was ugly. His, his behavior was obnoxious to the ducks, right? To the pond. And what did, they, what did the ducks do to that ugly duckling? They mistreated it, didn't they? They were mean to it. And it endured what? Persecution and pain, right? I mean, 
I still remember reading that, and I was like, I don't want to be the ugly duckling. And when I <laughs> looked at this, I realized that the ugly duckling is us, followers of Christ. Because when the ugly duckling finally realized his true nature was that it wasn't a duck, it was a what? It was a swan. And the swan realized that it couldn't stay, right, in that duck land because it was unwelcome. And one day, what did that swan do? It flew away. What I'm trying to point here is this, is this. As followers of Christ, we are not of this world. We are different from the world because of Christ who lives in us. And one day, yes, one day, we will all fly away. And we are here for a moment. Because one day our future destination is in heaven. Whether we die today or if Jesus comes back. And we can't expect the rest of the ducks to be like us, to, to, to believe whatever we want to believe in, our, in God's word. Because they're not of, we're, we're not of this world. I'm not saying we're ugly, we're not. We're all beautiful people. But it's important to understand that we're not of this world. And being persecuted, being becoming the minority because of how the world is changing is just part of following Christ. But God is in control. God knows what's happening. He understands and allows these things to happen because He has a plan and a purpose. Now that we've learned that, again, that we need to look to Jesus, we need to stay together, find joy in Christ, and that we are not of this world and we have to look to His Word for direction. The last thing I want to discuss is in verse 17 and 18. It says, in 16, I'll start at 16, They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Sanctify. That's a really Christian word. Sanctify them in your truth. Verse 17. You see, the word sanctify really means set apart. Set apart. As followers of Christ, we are set apart for God's work. We are set apart for a great purpose. We are set apart to be lights of the world. We are set apart to go and make disciples of all nations. We are set apart to bring hope in people's lives, to bring light in darkness. And here, Jesus prays, here, is praying to the Father for His disciples that as they are being sent into the world, that they be sanctified in the truth. What that means is that as we are set apart, we are continuing to grow in maturity in Christ. Meaning that we are... There's a process of God making us holy. Because being in the world is tough. Am I right? Being in the world is going to what I call enemy, en enemy territory. And what you're trying to do is you're trying your very best to show the love of God, but there's so much hate, there's so much darkness in the world, there's so much confusion in the world. But here God wants us to, to know that as He prays for us, He prays that we are, He prays that God, the Word of God continues to sanctify us. And that we, again, are continuing to be transformed by His Word. 
You see, when you follow Christ, it's, it's not just a one-day occurrence where you're all great and you don't ever have to read the Word of God anymore. No, as you give your life to God and follow Him, there's a process that we go through. You, you're a baby Christian, and you, as you continue to grow, you eat. And what you eat is, is His Word. What I call it spiritual food. You begin to know how to pray better. You, you begin to know how to share the Word of God to someone. And as you continue to grow, there's this process that the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. And I think it's important that as we are going into the world, that we are continuing to be sanctified by the Word of God. When I thought about this verse, about Jesus setting us apart, I thought about people in the world who have certain skills and abilities. Who are just extraordinary about their abilities. Who just have a, a gift in doing certain things. And I'm pretty sure all of us here have certain things that we're really good at. Right? And we, we excel at it. But there's certain people in the world that are just extraordinary about certain things. And like you look at it and you're like, whoa, that's amazing. When I, when I first, and, and she's not here, which I'm glad because she won't feel bad or feel like I'm pumping her up. When I first met Tiffany, Tiffany Davis, she's one of our members. When I first met her, she just had this energy about her. But I did not know that she had a really tremendous gift with kids, with children. And I've met a lot of people who are really good with kids. But Tiffany, as she began um, watching my kids, really had this great ability to not only become like a child and an adult at the same time and understand kids to their level and earn their respect right away and earn their, their allegiance and wanting to, to, to listen to Tiffany. And Tiffany has this extraordinary gift of really knowing how to care for kids and direct them. And she genuinely loves kids. I love kids, but certain times kids are like, oh man, I'm done, right? But Tiffany can spend time with kids all day. You see, in the same way, as Christians, if we understand our unique gift of being set apart from God, then we can truly be able to share the gospel with someone, be able to bring hope to someone's life. Because you and I, if you are a follower of Christ, you're distinct. You're extraordinary. Not because of what you have done, because of what, who lives in you and resides in you. We have the ability and have given this great responsibility to be lights of the world. To bring hope to people. To help bring change. When God gave that mandate for us to go and make disciples in Matthew 28, He gave it to us. Why didn't He give it to angels? Why didn't He give it to other creatures that He made? Or even to animals? If you think about it, He gave it to us. He gave it to us. Because there's something unique about us. We were created in the image of God. We are dearly loved by God. So don't ever forget that you are set apart. This morning, we are going to face these challenges in our culture. And it's going to keep happening. 
And it's teaching us these, these lies that we have to what? We, we, in order to be compassionate, we need to compromise. In order to, to, to continue to be obedient to God's word, we have to isolate ourselves. That's not true at all. Or even to, the, to, the, to these lie that in order to love someone, we have to agree with everything they believe or do. You could love someone and still have, do not agree with certain things they do. Jesus loved us. Do you think he agreed with our sins? No. Jesus loved the adulterer and forgave her. Do you think he agreed with her sins? No. But he never compromised his word. He never compromised the Father's mission for him. He didn't say, you know what, Jesus, I'm not going to die at the cross. I'm going to go build a church and be king. No. He was still obedient. He never compromised the word of God. He knew that he was sent for a great purpose, to be the savior of the world, even though it was so difficult for him. Interface SF, imagine as we face the changes in our city and in the country, imagine if we continue to be faithful to God's word and be lights of the world. As I close, this is the last thing I'm going to say. Jesus, I remember in John, I think in John, that this, Jesus gives this new commandment to his disciples. A new commandment I give you, he says. To love one another just as I loved you. If you do this, you will be my disciples. We have to love one another just as Christ loved us. And we have to love the people in our city and in the world just as Christ loves them. And in doing that, we must remain faithful to His Word and faithful to our calling. For one day we will not be here. One day we won't have that opportunity to help someone in need, to, show, to share someone the love of God. Because one day I won't be here. It's not that I don't like you guys, because I'm, but I, I'm excited to go to heaven. I'm excited to, to play ball with Jesus. Yes, I will really pray. We pray in ball, right? That's how I'm, uh, and I think every believer should have this excitement. That one day we will be in paradise with God. And that you will see Moses, you will see Apostle Paul, I'll see my sister, all these people who have gone in the past, who ran the race. Let's pray.